Such questions have been classically studied in reverse spaces. And then the relevant property is what's called crash charge property B. Just replacing the, the banner space by a Hilbert space. And relatively few, in some sense, groups satisfy this property. And to approach this general question of existence of fixed points, we will uh, do a cohomological reformulation of the question. And for this, we will look at generalizations or a generalization uh, geometric generalization of property P this will be for those who know a bit more in, in the style of the long Richardet theorem and then its relation to something I call here LP cohomology. So it turns out that this question is quite non-trivial because we lose the structure of Hilbert spaces and even, yeah. Where are those naturally such actions on non-Hilbert spaces? Oh, I mean, so, you... so why would you like to, to look at not... Yeah, I never, I never saw, saw uh, an isometric action of a group on a Banach space. Okay, so, so you could, for example, if you... So, so when do you have isometric actions? So for example, you could look at uniformly bounded representations, and then you just change the norm, and you will end up with a Banach space, where this action is an isometric. So this allows you to look at uniformly bounded representations, for example. Or then if you, you, you take a group with cash down property T, and then you ask, okay, does it have fixed points on, on some empty spaces? And, and this turns out to be non-trivial. When P grows large enough, the fixed point property will disappear. And we don't know what's the optimal P. Is the set where it disappears connected or not? There will be a lot of structure. So hopefully I will so, be so able to... Like, uh, there are machi proper machineries to, to generate such actions, such isometric actions in yeah, IP space. Yeah, yeah. And, and we will actually try to look at how to gen how to how to how to, how to do this. Mm -hmm. Which is actually But maybe I want to add that uh, so th those are machinery that uh, explain how to cut off this a man of representation out of a hill of representation maybe. But uh, in real life we study action of the space, you end up studying the group act action of the various functional spaces, not only L2. Right, but, but usually it's not by isometries. I mean, if you act by measure preserving transformation of X, then you will act by isometries of LP, X, or LP. That's, right? the, that's the answer that I, I did I miss. Okay. Okay. Yeah. It's like all the examples that I know for real space actions are actually immediately generate LP actions. So then first we will look into, into this. 
So, mm -hmm. throughout, we assume that gamma is a discrete group. This is optional, but we don't want to go into discussions on topology. And then E will be a real Anna space because we want to have a good characterization of the uh, bijective isometries. It will not matter for this talk, this is a bit pedantic, but if you look into the literature closely, this is what goes on. And now a representation of gamma on the Anna space E is a group on the morphism on the group into the operators on the Banner space into itself that are linear bounded and uh, vertical. And we call this representation isometric if phi g, which I will abbreviate like this, is an isometric. Like this. And then we recall that a map A from a banner space into itself is called affine whenever A acting on some B is a linear plus a transformation of translation where this notation this belongs to abbreviate this representation here by pi e. And now we call given a representation an affine pi action on e um, Given a, okay, an alpha and action on E by maps of linear part P is what? It's, um, it's given by A, G acting on B by the linear part being given by the representation plus a translation where this translation is from the group into the space and this is called an affine pi action. And this one here is called a cosine call. And for this to be an action we need to require that A G H is A G A H. And this is equivalent when you plug it in here, looking at what happens to the cosine calls. Whenever you have the so called co cycle condition, which says that E H is I Okay, so if you are given a representation, you construct 
an affine phi action on your finite space by this one here, and for it actually to be an action, you require that the co-cycles satisfy the co-cycle condition. And now you notice that some of these uh, of the co-cycles are special. So you notice that if there exists a vector in your Hana space such that your co-cycle Characterized by it um, like this, we call it a uh, co cycle a co boundary. And you notice that if it has if its uh, co-cycle is a co-boundary, then the action has a fixed point, meaning, well, it has exactly minus V in its fixed point. So these kinds of affine phi actions, where the co-cycle is of this form, has a, a fixed point. Okay? Uh, can I ask you mm -hmm. kind of an off question? So if your example of robotic space is like the little LP sequence space, uh -huh. what uh, what's your discrete group? Would you, do, you, do you have an example of a discrete group acting on that that you would be having on for such a case? I mean, you could like look at any isometries that I know. Okay, okay. But, but I mean, uh, I'm searching for for an example. I don't, I don't have an example in my head. Oh, oh, isometrics, huh? Yeah. Like, you also have an example in mind to play with while yeah. you're speaking. Yeah. Uh, not at this point. Okay. But you can look for it. So you can look for it. In your example, it would be just uh, translations. Translations. Yeah. Okay. So the right way. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you're looking for easy examples, you can just take the plane and then take the integers acting by translations, okay. like by shifting it, and then you will look at what, what is the affine action by by integers. Okay. Something like this. That's an easy example. Okay, so now we see that the affine phi actions, where the co cycle is of this form, called a co boundary, has a fixed point. And now we just, uh, I would say, there's a bigger theory behind this all, but let's just add to the zoom of cohomologies. So I've been naming this quite suggestively, and we define the one cohomology of the group gamma with respect to this representation as the co-cycles, not co-boundaries. And when you look at this, you realize that this uh, is a sum of, of two co-cycles in the co-cycle. Uh, okay. What do you mean by not? You, you, you declare two cycles being equivalent if they differ by a, additively by a cobanger? Yeah. So, so, for example, well, this will illustrate, I guess, your question. So, if this one homology vanishes, then you see that for affine phi, uh, affine phi actions, when this vanishes, it means that all cycles are co-boundaries, so all affine phi actions Ah, so it's an if, only if, if my FN action has a, has yeah. a fixed point, it is yeah, a yeah. one. Okay. Yeah, have a fixed point. So you can... Um, is it trivial? Yeah, yeah. So, so you look at this. So, okay, fixed point means this one. 
then you plug it in here uh -huh. under the co-cycle condition uh -huh. and you will see okay. <laughs> will it have a fixed point and then you ask the other way around yeah. and you, you will see it's an only it can only so this is a condition of fixed points and now we say well maybe I will wrote the fact here related to to cash down property P. So for gamma finitely generated the following This um, one cohomology of gamma zero for whenever rho is uh, unitary. Representation on a big batch space and G has property P. I'm not gonna go into what it means. These two are equivalent. This is somehow, this is, uh, yeah. In here, in the upper one, one is unitary position. Yeah, or orthogonal. And these two are equivalent. And now we take this, exactly this condition, replacing the unitary by the isometric pair to be our uh, generalized fixed point property. Reducing to the classic uh, cash down property P in case of unitary representations and uh, uh, big batch spaces. And th this is sometimes called uh, the Von Guichardé characterization of, of cash down property P. So, what I wanted to say with this is now we have a cohomological reformulation of our fixed point question we posed in the beginning. So we ask, when does every affine pi action, any affine isometric action have a fixed point? Well, it has a fixed point if this uh, one cohomology vanishes for every isometric action. So this is, the, this is the cohomology we will start to grow. And to do this, we will, uh, well, there's many ways. One of the ways we will now do is to go into LP cohomology. No, I need to look at the time. Wow, it's amazing. So I, I've spoken for 20 minutes now. Near the ball, the time runs even. Do you have some questions? When you vote. Already in your, <coughs> in your mind. So, we will do something very similar to what Rohan did, in a way. So we start looking at simplicial complexes. Okay, it will be always n-dimensional. And it will be locally finite. And I will take as my example here an ice cream cone to wake you up. Like this. Okay, so you see it has like I identify vertices. Point, so it has like one, two, three, zero axis vertices. The edges here I denote simply by, for example, zero, one, etc. Here we have a turbulent 
four and edges, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. And then we have faces here. So I hope this defines what I mean by this concept. We have three of them, so it's a nice screen plan. I don't include the other thing here. And when we say that our group gamma acts on x by simplicial So now we're trying to start to answer the question, when does this homology vanish? And it will be quite a long road, but... So, when this acts by simplicial automorphisms, we simply mean that it permutes simplices, and it preserves whatever Decorations. I want to talk to this art. So, for example, I could take here this group in the Geosmod tree acting on my ice cream cone generated by the element one. So that one acting on zero, one, two, three, just maps it to. 0, 2, 3, 1. So it would flip this face to the, to the face behind. So this is simply what happens. So they are not simply from that state. They definitely don't collapse any faces to edges or edges to points. And here I denote these always. I have uh, my unoriented. Synthesis and a set of them, a general K simplex, a point is a zero simplex, are denoted by these. For example, here in the ice cream cone, they would be just X zero would be one, two, three, zero. And then I denote the oriented ones. And I put an orientation on them. And this is a this is a decoration. So the group acting by simplicial automorphisms has to preserve the orientations. Simple. And then when we work with these general simplicial complexes, as we will be working, we need some kind of description of it, some kind of combinatorial one. Otherwise, we have no way of working with it. So we introduce a function omega called a weight. This one will be just the number of unoriented simplicial, no, unoriented and synthesis containing sigma. So for example, here, if I take my oriented simplex tau, then the weight of tau will be 2, because it's contained in two faces. And then you can check that this... So some, some of the... Some of the uh, not faces. Faces of... Uh, always assume that this is... So they are always contained in some face. Face is a maximum dimension. The face is a maximum dimension. Yeah, yeah. So we always look at n. Yeah. Always. So in a two simplex, we always look at in, in what two simplices does my vertex, my edge belong. In an n simplex, we always, in an n dimensional simplicial complex, I always look at the highest dimensional uh, object to which my edge belongs. So in a graph, I would look to how many edges does my vertex belong. In a two dimensional simplicial complex, into how many faces my vertex belongs, and so on. Your decoration is, is just a, a choice of orientation? Mm -hmm. on and this on is also a decoration. So I require that when I act by, by simplicial automorphisms, I move my edge somewhere, but it's, 
its weight doesn't change. If it belongs to two faces, it will it will still belong to two faces. This is the, this is another decoration. And then you can see that this one I'm going to give this if I give you some homework doing like this one here, you can check it for example for the picture. This one here means just that the vertices of tau are vertices of sigma. So when you look at the, well, this is called a weight. So the weight of sigma will actually always equal to. But you didn't tell us what are the oriented. Uh... You choose that. You, you just take right. your simplicial complex, you assign an arbitrary orientation. I mean, in applications, maybe you have an orientation. Here it's a So this one, this one I have. So for for power in the picture. Both sides. Um, I'm just confused regarding the definitions. Mm -hmm. uh, you said that there is a set of oriented synthesis and yes. unoriented synthesis. Yes. So it's kind of someone randomly chooses yes. uh, half of the synthesis to, and you orient them and somehow and half of the synthesis are, are staying unoriented? No, 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 no. So, okay, here you have, we will have to work with both of them. So you have an oriented synthesial complex where you order. Your ah, it's just two different complex. discussions, them, one of them... Yeah. Okay. yeah, this is just giving definitions. Ah, so and here you can see some kind of relation between them. So here we're looking at oriented synthesis, we're looking at how many unoriented n synthesis contain this one, and this is the combinatorial molecule. Yes. Oh, yeah. I'm confused regarding this... Uh, in, the space, in, in the space of synthesis. Uh -huh. In the space of all synthesis with all possible oriented orientations on each. Okay. Okay, in a way, simple simplex is an element of the second one. Okay. And, uh, and when you say uh, that you define the weight of, of, a, of a simplex sigma, mm -hmm. so you count yes. how so many this, this one, the I, I think this one will clarify completely your question when you look at how this one goes. So you choose your oriented simplex here, the edge. Mm -hmm. Then into how many unoriented uh, two synthesis does it belong to two? And if you would say to how many oriented synthesis yes, does it belong? Yes, a lot belong? more. Because of this space you would have six and of this you would have six. Okay, okay now I understand. Okay, good. And then you can check that this preserves here the weight. I mean the weight of this edge when you map it, it, it remains the same. You just look at how the thing goes. And then we need some further Notation. Oh, I, I imagine I am on time. This one here, it will be the gamma orbit of our k simplex. And then I try to denote it, this will be the uh, stabilizer of our oriented k simplex. And then, now, now we have a group acting on our simplicial complex, so we have a whole lot of orbits going on, and we choose representatives from every orbit. These are just the uh, orbit representatives. Finally, we're in the business. So now we set up the LP cohomology. So here will be a lot of, I mean, Building the objects of the chain and co-chain complex will be more difficult because you're not in a Hilbert space where everything is complemented and everything is very nice. So we have to pay some additional attention in the beginning to our objects in the chain and co-chain complex. And this will be two distinct chain and co-chain complexes not going together because we don't have the Hilbert space structure and we will see how this goes. So from now on, I will assume that the group acts on the X um, properly discontinuously. 
you don't need anything but to know that the stabilizers, this harm ratio, will be this one is finite. This is not a must, but we will do it. And then we assume that this, uh, our final space is reflexive. Then I just uh, start to build this L P homology. So I define a space, which I will call my co-chains. Space of the co chain co-chains. To be the following space, it will be all the maps from oriented k synthesis into our final space. Okay, so in L, in, in the little LP cohomology, we had to go into the reals or whatever. So now we're gonna go into the final space. So, but just to make sure you, the, your example is kind of useless because it's a finite space. Right? Yes, and yes, now it's useless. So it was only useful to get. To, to, to get the permutation stuff right. It's actually a big worry when you start to look how to do this. And you require them to have uh, some ability condition, which is the following. So you sum over all of your orbit representatives. You take the weights, and then you have some kind of normalization factor going on. You require this to be fine. These are your k cochains, and this defines your kp norm going on here. And now a fact, which is standard pana space, stuff is that these two spaces are uh, isometrically isomorphic. So you take your space of code chains and you look at its continuous dual. So this will hold. Now you just replace here the argument and keep by itself the conjugate. You do this, and then you have the dual pairing here, which I denote by this. I, I want to keep this to you because I want to make a short comment on the co-differential, which Roman spoke about. So this one gives this isometric isomorphism. Where is this cape? Oh, from here. Yeah. So this has to do with the uh, with the way we are working with, like, having oriented. Oh, you're, you're and, and the choice of having, like, um, yeah, and I want to say, these are just normalization factors to make everything nice. I mean, in, in the end, work with oriented or unoriented, the only thing that matters is that you can carry out the combinatorics in the end. Just, just, to, just to explain, I think now you look at k sequences, and you want to consider some sort of cage of chains of case sequences mm -hmm. in a some sort of values in E, in some completed version. Mm -hmm. So this is the, the space uh, E K P. Mm -hmm. Is it E or E? Yeah. Oh. Okay. It's fine. Right. Clearly, clearly, clearly. clearly. And uh, the, uh, this pairing uh, indexed by K is the pairing between this space and, the, and this dual. For every K years, actually. Yeah. Okay. So, sigma, K, yeah. sigma, these are the oriented K synthesis. And this, okay. Take the plane, triangulate it. Like this. Integers acting here. You get the orbit, for example, here. This is the C orbit. And then you choose one, for example, edge as your representative, and you put it in here. And then you go in every layer, and this will be your representatives of your orbit. So this subtraction is even, is even interesting, even if gamma now, is trivial, right? Just 
Yeah, yeah, but but this is not something you can work with still. So we need to restrict. This will not be our object in the chain complexes. So now we need to. We have a any map like this. We define its alternation. This is just how you do for differential forms in in. Uh, differential geometry when you make them alternating. Like this. And you call F alternating. metric if this is zero and now you also want to say that f is twisted kind of g equivalent by pi whenever these two agree okay so now you will notice that in, in terms of the norm we will always assume that this here is an isometric to say it, it's important. So it will be constant on orbit. So if we would not look at orbit representatives, this sum would always be infinite because our these maps are constant on that. And now we define the space L P K P. This this is the important space. Just the same. This equation of pi G F equals F of G. So yes. It's a tautology or not? Not. Why what, what's, the, what's the so this of is pi g on f? Pi g is the pi is the represent, representation here. So it's a mm. but ah okay I'm completely confused. There is in the background there is an e with an isometric action and then you build and then there is also. A, a simplex x yes. which you act and by these two you build this yes you have the data your planet space your group and my c and my it's here simplicial complex. Simplicial complex and then you have a and a priori there is no relation between the two actions no and somehow this this relation says yes yes yeah. so so now we want to look at these maps we want to look at exactly those f's which belongs to the those growth chains that are twisted and alternating. And uh, okay, so this is the this is our space of twisted growth chains. This is what we build our cohomology theory on. It's non-trivial that these two here take the continuous dual of this one, that it's actually isometrically isomorphic to this space. So you need to find a, a continuous projection from your co-chains to your continuous, to your twisted alternating co-chains. And this one will not be an isometry if your representation is not an isometry, it will only be an isomorphism. But these are the same. And I think uh, what you will see immediately after this should make this entire construction clear. I hope so. I, I still have nine minutes, so I, I think I will try to you know, salvage everything at the end. But, but mm -hmm. you're the only speaker today, right? Yes. And why would you continue to twist as well? Yeah. I rather understand what you're saying instead of... Okay, the... so I will go through this at, at the same pace, and then in the end I will try to clarify all possible questions. Because I think that when you see, this is, uh, this is something you basically have to come up with. It doesn't exist a priori. So it's not easy to see. You do many tries. You, you try to work with these spaces, it doesn't work. 
uh, you have these spaces, you're not sure if it will work. Even to get this isometric isomorphism here, it's kind of uh, trivial if the group action is free, but if it's, uh, if it's not free, you have to somehow do averages over stabilizers and try to construct it. It's, it's far from clear. However, finding an object with this property is good because you will have for these G equivariant maps, these, uh, these maps here, this one will have nice combinatorial properties that you otherwise, if, if you ignore this condition here, you, you will not be able to work, you, you will not get a working theory. I mean, maybe, maybe you will get without, without doing this, this business, but it's not, it's not clear. So now, this, these will be the, the objects of the LP homology. And now we want to see what the differentials and co-differentials are. And at this point, I think it will clarify a lot. So we have chain and co-chain complexes. So you define a co-differential it goes from your space of twisted co-chains to one higher so the naming comes from the increase of the, of the in index and you define this as as usual. And you will notice that if you compose two, this one is zero. And correspondingly, you will define a map the bar over it from L K delta conjugate to this is just notation. So kind of you have two different co-differentials because these spaces are not the same. They're not filled spaces. You have two like this, and now it's not trivial, well, it, it, it is expected. <laughs> so this D K is bounded. It has an adjoint. The differential. And the differential is the map D Going from, well, it goes in the other direction. And now you notice that, so you take the adjoint. This was what Roman denoted by D star. So it goes from the dual of this into the dual of this. And now we know that these are not only isomorphic, but isometrically isomorphic. So we have a map I just replaced, I, I put in the stars here. So this is one important thing because now we kind of have control over what our differential is. Like this. And this is just uh, given by the dual pairing explicitly. pairing between G and the differential of F. This is just to keep track on that these act on K plus one synthesis. Like this. And now you might wonder, 
What's wrong, Andre? What you have here for an explicit expression from this that you can count from the dual quadrant. And I, I give you the, the fact you need for this. Um, and also the reason I give it to you is to, is to show that we have to restrict to twisted maps. Because what you need to figure out what this explicitly is, you actually need, need the fact that these are twisted by the representation. So this differential, if g is a map, This is just juxtaposition. So you require that when you, if you have a syntax like 0, 1, and you juxtapose it by your vertex like 2, this creates 2, 0, 1, and you require that this belongs to your simplicial complex for it to be in this sum. Okay? And this will be the weight of the juxtaposition of. And to do this, if you want to do this, over, use the following fact. So this is what you actually need. For 0, L, K less than N, and F, tau, sigma, uh, gamma, invariant function, Uh, on the pairs tau sigma, where this tau is an L simplex oriented, sigma is a K simplex, I think, yeah. And then the vertices of tau are vertices of sigma. It holds that when you sum over, this is kind of a Fubini, combinatorial Fubini. And sum of the representatives followed by summing over oriented L synthesis of this function over the stabilizer. This is equal to the summing over the representatives of L synthesis and So from this, you, you see many things. First of all, it's surprising that it will be this difficult to, to actually, no, not difficult, but not really. You need to prove that before you prove the explicit form of this one here. And this shows you more importantly that if you did not restrict to gamma invariant chains, here, if you wonder what these are, this will actually be the, so what are gamma invariant functions? I forgot to say something very important that the weight is g or gamma equivariant. So this function in, in the application will consist of the weight of tau and sigma, and then also of the norms of the values of this function, because th this is, uh, you take f sigma, g sigma, like this. What is the norm of this? It is the norm of this one here by the twisting condition. And this is an isometry, so this is the norm of F sigma. 
So we see that all the objects appearing in the non-condition restricting to our K cochains are gamma invariant. So, so we can use this in the non-condition, and using this, we are able to come up with the co-differential. And now we have the chain complexes. I hope I can try to write them down. I think I have. Can I keep this to 30 and 30, like eight minutes more? Okay, then I think uh, I'm able to wrap it up so that you get something out of it. Except I lost one. Before. So what do we have now? If we have chain complexes, I'm always, all the time, using this isometric isomorphism going on here. And then we also have the, the one going in the other direction. And here you see the difference to the L2 cohomology that we were speaking about earlier. are not, because they are not Hilbert spaces, these cannot be identified. So we have two different chain complexes that are involved in LP homology. This is the important difference. And as Roman spoke about the Laplacian, which you composed with, so this is maybe illustrative to keep in mind. Oh, these indices. These are the two. So you cannot a priori oppose these two, but you might try to construct some kind of, of different Laplacian, and I think this is a good idea to, to try to do. And now you finally define your LP cohomology. Notice that, well, when does this vanish? It vanishes when this um, d k minus 1 is, it is onto the kernel of d k, which is the same as saying that uh, it's a joint. This brings in the other chain complex. So you will, if, if you want to calculate your LP cohomology, you, you have two chain complexes at your disposal, and this is kind of like the first immediate relation between the two of them. And now you could uh, look at what happens if your group action is somewhat nice, and this one Yes, and th these apparently are important. <laughs> uh, if you form the Laplacian as... Yes, yes. 
So that would be very interesting. So do you know with no, the I, I have not. Uh, I have not done it, but I think uh, I'm, 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 the, I'm ashamed of admitting I haven't done it. So the problem, <laughs> the mental problem with all of this is uh, combinatorial mistakes. Maybe I will return in the end to this, but this is the fully suggested is probably uh, the, the best way to go. Because when you work, when you then try to see when this LP homology vanishes, you will take some kind of a simplicial complex with some property, so that you have automatically your group acting by automorphisms on this one. And, and the properties that you can choose for this is, for example, to look at the links of every vertex, where you have some kind of a Poincaré inequality going on. And these Poincaré inequalities, when you're in one of spaces, you will never get equalities. You will always get some kind of bad estimates, which are not sufficient. And what Uri is saying is that if you look at this at the level of the operators, you might be able to postpone these problems far enough to be able to carry out everything you wish. And just to, to make a connection with the, with the first thing we spoke about, the generalized trash dump property P, how does this relate to it? Well, if your group acts on X, your simplicial complex co compactly, your summing conditions don't matter at all. So actually, your L, P, not. Yes. Um, so your summability conditions don't matter. So you can forget about them and just look at your alternating maps twisted by the representation, which is this one. So this is the cohomology of chain complex on twisted chain co-chains and then if your x is contractible because your group action is nice enough then this one will actually I, I think this was exactly what, what Roman was speaking about. Uh, what did he call it? The classification, classification space of, of gamma. So this one is classifying, classifying space. So this one will be exactly the same as your group. So, so this is your uh, group cohomology with coefficients in the representation. So, so this will this will agree all of this. So, so this is the way to to find new groups with the fixed point properties. So you somehow the basic setup is that you should construct a simplicial complex on which you act by automorphisms. This is not a priori maybe easy, but it can be done. Uh, and then you will know, that you will get this kind of information out of it. Maybe that's not the right. Mm. Yeah. So I think I will, I will end here and, uh, and uh, answer questions if you have, if you have any of them. <laughs> I'm sorry for the face. I was going to be trying too much, but... When X was contractible, what? What it means? So just... No, no I mean... The last, the last thing. Oh! What is the case? Yeah, I don't know so much about... Group group group. Group. I, I think it's... Uh, does it have to be free? Maybe it's I mean, not... It might have like, finite sterilizers, but yeah. we don't want... Okay, so properly discontinuous. And, and go compact here means 
just that your number of orbits of the center fix is finite, so your summability condition is always true. Yeah, we didn't realize how fast time is passing, so that's why the timing was this. So thanks again.